In this one, we're looking at the tune I Got Rhythm. This tune was written by George Gershwin in 1930, which is five years after Sweet Georgia Brown was composed, which we talked about in the last episode. I Got Rhythm has become so ubiquitous in the world of jazz that we often shorthand the name to just simply rhythm. A lot of the time we're only talking about the chord progression, which is probably the most common harmonic framework for improvisers aside from the blues. I'm sure that more contrafacts have been written on this tune than any other. We refer to a chord progression as chord changes, or just the changes. So this particular chord progression is known as rhythm changes. Over the years, jazz musicians have altered or elaborated on the original chords, and there are variations even on the basic chord progression. I Got Rhythm is a 32-bar AABA form. In the original song, there's a two-bar tag at the end, but when you're improvising, you'll stick to the 32-bar form. Although the chords take you through five key centers, there's only one note in the melody that's non-diatonic. Probably one of the most familiar contrafacts on I Got Rhythm is the theme song for the Flintstones cartoon. That melody is entirely diatonic. If it's possible to write a melody on this chord progression that's mostly or entirely diatonic, then it's also possible to improvise diatonically. As I've talked about previously, that might be theoretically simpler, but it's not easy to improvise an interesting solo without any of the color tones in the harmony. When you try to do that, it makes you appreciate the simple perfection of a melody that stood the test of time. In the A sections, the melody suggests a major pentatonic scale pattern constructed from 5, 6, 1, 2, and 3. That gives the improviser something to go on. A slight alteration to that pattern would be to add the sharp 2, which would be C-sharp in this case. That'd be a chromatic approach to the major third, which opens up some interesting melodic pathways. Now, interestingly, the addition of the C-sharp gives us the notes of a G minor blues scale. C-sharp, or the enharmonic equivalent D-flat, would also be the flat third of the B-flat blues scale, and it's possible to improvise effectively over the A sections with just the B-flat blues scale. <laughs> Now, I'll talk about the chords in the A section in a minute, but first, let's go to the bridge. The melody in the bridge is very simple. It's based on roots and fifths. We see the one non-diatonic melody note in the second bar of the bridge. The chord progression should look familiar to you if you've watched the last few episodes. It's a cycle, starting on the three dominant and winding up on the five dominant. This progression has become known as a rhythm bridge. On some contrafacts, like Oleo by Sonny Rollins, there's no melody for the bridge. It's just left open for improvisation. The dominant chords of the bridge take you through four key centers, and each key center is one note different than the adjacent key centers. Understanding how the scales evolve through the modulation, changing one note at a time, gives you a direction for your melodic lines. 
we can see two clear guide tone lines, one starting on the third of the three dominant and the other one starting on the flat seven. The guide tones move down in half steps from the third of one chord to the flat seven of the next and vice versa. As I've shown in other videos, I can outline the basic harmonic structure of the cycle with triads or a simple scale pattern like 1, 2, 3, 5 on each dominant chord. I could also play a slightly more intricate melodic line, but one that still hews closely to the chord tones. bebop scales over the dominant chords allows me to create eighth note lines that define the key center. The unique element of the bebop scale is that it has two consecutive half steps from the root down to the flat seven. You can actually imply the sound of the dominant chord from just these three notes. Now, without going into too much detail, I'll note that there are variations on the dominant cycle in the bridge. The most obvious would be to add two chords in the first, third, fifth, and seventh bars. From an improviser's standpoint, that doesn't really change very much. The two fives define the four key centers in the same way that the dominant chords do. Most jazz musicians would treat a dominant chord like a two five anyway. Another variation would be to move the dominant chords by half steps rather than through the cycle. That leaves the three chord and the two chord unchanged, while the six chord and the five chord become tritone subs. That'll make sense if you've watched these videos. Now we're going to go back and look at the chords in the A section. There are three common harmonic devices in these sections that I'll point out. The first is 1625, which occurs twice in the first four bars. As Gershwin wrote them, these are all diatonic chords, meaning they're derived from the home key of B flat. Jazz musicians will usually make the six chord dominant for the blowing, as I've talked about in other videos. That creates a stronger sense of forward motion from the six chord to the two chord. In the third bar, the one chord could be replaced by a three chord, since D minor seven and B flat major nine are the same chord except for the root. One, six, two, five, and three, six, two, five are used pretty much interchangeably. It's a go-to progression for a rhythm section that needs to create an intro or a vamp on the spot. In the fifth bar, the one chord becomes dominant, either for the entire bar or on the second half of the bar. That sets up a resolution to the four chord in the sixth bar. One major and four major are both diatonic chords in the home key of B flat, and there's only one note difference between the key centers of B flat and E flat. So this is a very common modulation. You'll see it on a lot of tunes, although not this one, moving from the A section to the bridge. In this case, we don't stay in the key center of E flat for very long because the second half of the sixth bar transitions us back to B flat. It does this in one of two ways. The first is to move up a fourth or down a fifth from the four chord to a dominant chord based on the flat seven, which is A flat dominant seven in this key. This is easier to understand if we look at the relative two chord. The relative two of A flat dominant is E flat minor, which would be the four minor chord in this key. The movement from four major to four minor to one is a very familiar sound. From a pianist's standpoint, E flat major to A flat dominant is a more interesting progression, and that's the way you'll usually see it written. But from an improviser's standpoint, I think it's a lot easier to think of it as four major to four minor. Now another alternative is to play sharp four diminished in the second half of the sixth bar. We've seen this exact progression in the sixth bar of the jazz blues progression. The upper two notes of E diminished are the same as the upper two notes of E flat minor. 
so the difference happens in the bottom two notes of the chord. So at this two-beat point in the changes, whether you're talking about a flat seven dominant or a four minor or a sharp four diminished, those are like different roads all taking you to the same place. And since rhythm changes are usually played pretty fast, it's not worth a lot of worry on your part which one to use. But I wanted you to be aware of the different chords that you might see on a lead sheet. So now I'm going to try to pull all of this together into a couple of demonstrations. In the first one, I'll play two choruses at two different tempos. On the first chorus, I'll be listening to a metronome clicking on two and four. And on the second chorus, I'll play with a faster backing track from Jamie Abersold. Now, working with a metronome, of course, is good for your time feel. And it's also a test of how well you've internalized the chord changes and the form. The downside of practicing with a metronome is that all the ideas are coming from you. There's no external input from other musicians. Also, time feel is different when it's coming from a group of musicians as opposed to a machine. That's one big reason why I prefer the Abersold play-alongs to an app like Band in a Box.